right, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is a different format than what we used last time, so that's making it a little more um, <laughs> exciting or challenging. Um, at this point in time, I am going to um, uh, call you by name, and if you could at this time unmute your microphone so that we can hear your eye, and then when I'm done with quorum, I'm gonna ask that everyone then mute their microphones. So at this time, when I call your name, if you could just say aye, that would be most helpful. I'm gonna attempt to do this in alphabetical order. So, starting at the top, Meg Albrink. Aye. Chris Camp. Aye. We're having a great feedback here. Um, it's almost like a concert. Um, moving on to Alderperson Mary Lynn Donahue. Here. Marco Esquivara. Aye. Nancy Manchin. Aye. Kathy Norman. Aye. Sherry Speth. Aye. Kyle Welton. Aye. Wonderful. So uh, thank you all for being here for this uh, round two of a virtual uh, library board of trustee meeting. Um, at this time, if you would not, uh, if you wouldn't mind sort of uh, muting your mic and uh, we will uh, stand and uh, pledge allegiance to our flag. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we are now um, moving on to uh, public comments, and I'm very sad to share that we have nobody here except for Garrett Erickson and myself in the room and our wonderful IT specialist that is uh, making sure that we don't push too many wrong buttons. So that is it <laughs> for this lovely City Hall uh, Council Chambers. Um, I am now going to move to the next item on the agenda, which is 1.4, um, approval of the minutes. At this time, if someone would like to unmute their uh, microphone and make a motion to approve our uh, minutes. Kyle, I so move. Thank Very you. Gary. All right, so it's been moved and seconded. Thank you. Uh, are there any uh, discussion points? Hearing no discussion points, all those in favor, and at this time, <laughs> you can unmute your mics. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. And uh, now we can go back to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is 1.5, Correspondence, Announcements, and Common Council uh, Reports. And uh, if you would like to take the time to unmute your, uh, excuse me, to mute your microphone, uh, that would be uh, most helpful. Um, as I had shared at the start of this meeting that, um, uh, and in an email to all of you, uh, it is, uh, very challenging to try to run a virtual meeting and make sure that we can respectfully hear everyone. So when we do get to the discussion components of our um, agenda, I am going to go in order and call on each one of you. And at that time, you can share your questions or your comments on the topic, or you can even just sort of say, I have no questions and comments at this time. Uh, but I want to make sure that uh, everyone does have an opportunity to chime in to help us have a, a full discussion. So uh, that's just sort of the housekeeping of our wonderful uh, meeting here. Uh, next, I just wanted to uh, take a moment to share that uh, uh, this is actually uh, National Library Week. So kudos to our board for just always 
having a board of trustee meeting during a wonderful week in which we celebrate uh, libraries. Um, and I just wanted to share a few uh, key points about it. Uh, the reason they have this week is it gives us an opportunity to really celebrate the contributions of our nation's libraries and library workers and to really promote the library use and support. Uh, anywhere from free access to books and online resources for families to library business centers that help support entrepreneurship and re retraining to educational and enriching programming. Libraries offer opportunity to all. Interestingly, at least I found it rather interesting, the theme for the National Library Week 2020 is find your place at the library. And it was chosen last year long before this emergence of the COVID-19 global pandemic. Hence, uh, the theme was actually changed just a little bit. It was altered to find the library at your place. Those clever librarians, they just changed the order of the words of the theme to make it work. So that kind of made me smile that they were so quick and wily to do that. Um, I just wanted to also kind of add that this impact of this COVID-19 crisis has continued to evolve for our entire community, our state, our nation, and the entire world. And that really changed a lot of the work that libraries and library workers um, have been doing. Um, they are proving once again to be so resourceful and resilient, uh, serving as a rich pipeline for content, delivering access to ebooks, movies, music, video games, virtual story times, Little Rev, uh, and so many other fascinating activities. And so uh, we, are, we as a board are just so grateful for the creativity and the tenacity of our talented uh, library staff at Mead Public Library. And it's my hope that when we actually get to be more open, that we can have a much more physical celebration of all the incredible work that they uh, continue to do for our citizens. Another fun fact that I wanted to share that my daughter actually pointed out to me is that today is William Shakespeare's birthday. It's not very often you get to have a library board meeting on Shakespeare's birthday. Um, mm. Another uh, community point that I just wanted to share is that the deadline for any uh, citizen to apply for the uh, poet of Sheboygan, uh, that deadline is April 30th. And it is my hope that um, our libraries, uh, librarians will have an opportunity to work with the mayor's office to determine who should get that incredible honor to continue to promote uh, literacy and poetry in our community. And my final point that I wanted to share um, uh, with this meeting is the fact that uh, this is our uh, the end of the term for uh, all of us that have done our three-year terms. And I'm happy to share that um, our trustees that uh, were um, all offered an opportunity by our mayor to continue on with an additional term. Uh, so uh, we uh, will most likely be joined by one new person since we have one uh, vacant seat. Uh, the new terms will begin next month, which also means we will also have elections and I will be sharing more information via email to all of you. So with all of that um, out of the way, um, I'm going to uh, now uh, just jump to 2.1. And as I look at my agenda, I realize I combined 1.5 and 1.6 together. So talk about trying to keep the meeting running. Uh, but I'm going to turn this over to um, uh, Garrett Erickson for 2.1 bulletin board uh, policy. As soon as I remember which button I'm supposed to push, I am so sorry, Garrett. <laughs> He's pretending there to be go. Rose I'm Phillips. Rose He's sitting in Rose Phillips' seat, so I got to get that working. So, okay. So, 2.1 uh, 2 bulletin board policy. It seems sort of a trivial uh, agenda item at this point with everything that's gone on. But uh, maybe a month or two ago, we did have an issue with um, some controversial stuff being put up on the bulletin board. And so I did ask Melissa to go back and look at the policy and see if there was any updates needed. And she did re redo this policy. It had been quite some time, at least prior to me being here, so it's at least seven years old um, that we've looked at it. But she did simplify it a bit, and you can take a look at it. It essentially says that we have the right to not post 
uh, anything that's going to be controversial that's going to offend people. And uh, so that's sort of what this policy is about, is just giving us some leeway as staff to, uh, to decide what we're going to put up on the bulletin board. So I guess I'll open this up if there's any questions on it. I have a question. Uh, Kathy, yes. Yeah, so it, it becomes sort of subjective. So if we give people, um, you know, subjective leeway to decide what's controversial or what's not, who's to say we don't end up with like a racist person on <laughs> on staff or a, you know, pro-life person on staff that agrees to put stuff up that we find objectionable? I, I'm just a little concerned with who makes the decisions. Well, we're, we're actually delegating that down to the staff that work at the front desk, and they've done a great job of, of watching that for us. Um, in this case, I did get a, a complaint from a citizen um, that saw something up there, and it was in regards to abortion, and they called me, and so I went up there and looked at it, and it... It was a it was a rally, and I'm not going to say which side, but it was uh, you know it was something that was placed up there, and so normally the staff catch those sorts of things, and um, I think they do a really good job. So it is subjective to some extent, but um, if it if it triggers that we if it raises a red flag, um, who's ever doing that work is going to bring it to one of the managers, and they're going to make a decision. Uh, this is Here, I know in the, oh. um, it's Nancy in the original. The phrase, um, with the approval of the director or designee, is included in the, bill the bulletin board policy. And um, I wondered if it would be helpful to put that into the revised version or some reference to, uh, to whom would the approval would be given. That's a good About catch, Nancy. That's a really good catch. I agree. We could add that in there. Good. Anyone else? I do know that when I first joined, this is Maeve, <laughs> I do know that when I first joined the board, we revised the uh, bulletin board policy because staff felt that it was not giving them um, clear direction. So that was, I don't know, eight something years ago. So I know that the original policy involved uh, the staff uh, giving us ideas of how to make it more clear so they could make better decisions of what belongs on the bulletin board for the community. Any further discussion on this? Oh. This is Kyle. I Kyle? Um, the, uh, the, the paragraph right after item five, it just says, the library will not display posters, petitions, or notices from political parties, candidates, or those advocating a position on a public issue. Um, I do understand that, but I know that often the ROCA room is utilized for programming that may be, um, whether it's a, a candidate's forum or an educational piece on an issue or group, would that preclude them? Obviously, there's plenty of other ways of marketing that, but I'm just curious, would that preclude that type of announcement or poster there, or is it because it's reserved in the library, it's considered co-sponsored by the library, or... Um, not that big a deal. I'm just kind of I'm just curious if that would be included in that that language. Melissa, are you on on right now? Yep, I'm here. This is Melissa. Hi, everyone. Hey, Hello. So I would say, um, Kyle, that it would not include those things. This really is for that very small bulletin board right when you walk in the library that we reserve for community groups to use. So this wouldn't affect programs that the library sponsors. And I think in the case of something like a candidate forum, um, that to me is, at least my interpretation of that would be that that is not advocating for a particular party or candidate. It's simply informational. So I would see that as being fine to be posted on that public bulletin board. Um, and just a little more context for for why we needed to change this, um, both the issue that Garrett mentioned that kind of precipitated this um, was an issue that was somewhat confusing to the staff member because um, they weren't real clear on what this particular organization was exactly stood for. And 
there's also the issue that um, sometimes people post things to the bulletin board without bringing them to us first. Um, and we do try to catch those things and take them down, um, but occasionally we, we miss that. So this really is um, intended to make things easier for staff. Um, and certainly anything that our staff is confused about, they often do ask me about because um, we do try to avoid posting things um, like fundraisers, uh, brat fries, that kind of thing. Um, so if there's any confusion, usually a manager will be notified. And we can Melissa, make a call on that. Is, Melissa, this is Nancy. Is there a, an initialing or a stamp or something that goes on whatever is posted? So when you look there, you say, oh, yeah, the library or designee um, approved it. There isn't, but we could certainly do that. I don't know. I, you know, that may be just more work for you, but just wondered if visually it, it would speed things up. If you can, if you do take a look at that bulletin board, it's the one to the right when you walk into the building. Um, you can tell the staff have been involved because most bulletin boards that you go to in the community are pretty haphazard looking, and these are all stapled up, and they're all in the same size paper, and they look really organized and nice. This is Cheryl um, from me speaking. As, as far as that stamp goes, I guess I caution using Mead's name on it, the Mead Public Library name on it, just because some people, you know, could really take that bar and call it an endorsement of whatever information is on there. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe, maybe just like a pink dot or something, you know, something without the name. Thank you. Okay, any other uh, discussion points? Would someone like to make a uh, motion to uh, pass the new revised board policy? This is Kyle, I so move. I'll second that. Mary Lynn, second. Okay, good, we got double seconds, so it could be Nancy or Mary Lynn, thank you both. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Hi. Hi, and thank Hi. you. Hi. <laughs> uh, thank you for the thumbs up, Marcos. I can finally see all of you. Uh, the, our, our system only allows us to see one person at a time speaking, so um, it's great seeing the eyes all at once. <laughs> I can see lots of great faces. Um, all right. Uh, uh, let's see. Moving on then to 2.2, approve of the CIP projects at the Capital Improvement Projects, and I'm turning this over to Library Director Garrett Erickson. So there's actually uh, one project for each year. So we're looking at um, the first project being uh, the materials return room that would be in the page area. Um, we actually had a discussion and a vote on this at the last meeting. However, we did have uh, a couple of inspectors, the fire inspector and the building inspector in and talked about it and there was some issues with how uh, basically the materials we were going to use for the room needed to be changed and lots of changes since we actually met last and so the price has gone up significantly um, on the room I believe we voted I'm just going to ballpark around fifteen thousand dollars was the room I believe it was us and now it's way up to about thirty five thousand I think it was stated at the finance committee meeting Debbie if you want to give me the specific numbers I don't have those in front of me um, the first quote was right around the 15, and the second came up to the new proposal that we just got right before the meeting is at. Thirty-four thousand four hundred and twenty-seven. We did have to add a sprinkler system into that room, and that's what helped bring that cost up because of the temperatures going up to one hundred forty thousand. I mean, one hundred forty degrees. <laughs> And so this was discussed very briefly at the Finance Committee meeting and was approved. And so now we're bringing it to the full board for discussion. So at this time, it, if anyone would like to ask a question or a comment, they're welcome to do so. Yeah, it's me. This is Kyle from the Finance Chair. I'll just note that um, I asked 
this be brought back. We did approve this before, but I just felt that the board should approve it given the, the size of the increase. But this is an important improvement for the library. Um, I, I hope that we approve it today. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Hey, this is Meg. Um, and it's related to the, the attachment that was in the board doc area. Um, the date on the document say 2019, and I'm not sure if they should say 2020 and report date and meeting date, or if I'm looking at the wrong attachment. That is a different, that, well, that, that's the second project for 2021 that we'll be talking about, but the, yes, that's, that's right. The meeting date in, is wrong on that. I see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they say 2019 instead of 2020. So, mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm looking at Thanks. the wrong thing. Then. That's okay. That's, we, you would have caught it for the next part of the discussion anyway. I have a question. This is Chris. Will this room be used for the future when things are dropped off as well, whenever that date will be? Yes, Chris. Jared, I can answer that. Oh. That room also will um, do away with the COVID virus, is what I was told. So from Bernie Romer, the city purchasing agent. Potentially, but let's not market it as that because that's uh, jumping way ahead than any of the tests that have been done on it. So the real the real reason for the for that room right as of right now was we were in the process of trying to figure out how to eradicate the bed bug issue that we were having um, with a, just a small amount of patrons that were bringing materials back, but then our staff having to look through every single item. Um, instead, we would just place those items in that room for a period of time um, to kill those bed bugs, and then we would not have to do that inspection process, and we would know that everything was caught. So that was really the reason for the room. Uh, the virus thing, maybe that'll pan out, but uh, hard to say at this point. I just, I haven't seen any lab uh, results to know uh, any of that, so I hate to put that out there. This is Sherry. Uh, when will the uh, materials room be completed? Debbie or Cheryl, I'm, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what, how, um, as, go ahead. As soon as we get the approval to them, they'll start ordering the materials and they feel that they can get that room done for us. Uh, when we started at April 1st, they figured they could have had it done by April 30th. Mm -hmm. I'll have to see what their schedule is, but I know they do know it's a top priority. It is to our benefit that this is something that can be accomplished during the time that we have less people in the building. Any other further questions or comments? Thank you. So at this time, would someone like to make a motion to approve the CIP projects? Just, just oh. the 2021 oh, first. Just, excuse me, the 2021. I'll move, Kathy. Kathy Norman, I'll move to approve. Jerry, second. Okay, uh, it looks like moved and seconded. Uh, thank you. Uh, any further discussion points? Then all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Uh, motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on then to 2.3, discussion of services offered. Actually, Maeve, uh, could I, I didn't oh. get a chance to finish up the second part of the 2.2, oh. sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. We wanted to get a vote on each project individually. So the, uh, the second part is the um, CIP city process, which I, on Monday I will be going in front of the uh, Capital Improvements Project um, city co committee and we will be asking for continued um, uh, help, financial help from the city on our HVAC control replacement project. So we have two years left that we would need funding. Um, this has already been approved for 2020. Um, 
so we need to have that done. It was approved for 2019, and then we'll get this uh, the same amount of 66,278 approved for 2021 and 2022. There's a possibility that we could uh, maybe get that all done in one year. We're not sure how the quotes will turn out, but we would need approval for me to um, to go ahead and ask for that money through this body. So, and then uh, uh, if approved on Monday, I would go advocate for that with the city council. Okay. Are there any uh, questions for Garrett on these uh, projects that would go before the city's uh, capital improvement um, committee? I don't have any questions per se, but I don't think that was attached to our board docs. Um, when I look at 2.2, the only document that was attached was the one that was dated 2019. You know, the one that we just updated 2020. Maybe I have an old version of board doc. What was this one for next year? Are you in the That's finance? Too, Kathy. Oh. Okay. Maybe it just wasn't attached. The board docs. So it is attached, I believe, in board docs. I don't know. I'm seeing it right now. Hmm. In Not under two point two. Are you in the finance committee agenda? Or are you in the full board? Uh, full board. Okay. I'm able to get to it. And that's where I I didn't see the materials room update. I just saw the the summary document. That's correct. We did have a discussion about this. I might as well uh, just acknowledge this to the board. So at the finance committee meeting, we talked about how in the past we've been sending things through email to the group and, and part of the discussion is we should really be putting something in board docs and, and perhaps we've been hesitant in the past because there's uh, quotes in there, proprietary quotes, which we were told in the past shouldn't be part of uh, public facing documents. However, um, as Kyle noted, we could be putting some sort of a memo out that has the price in that without giving away uh, proprietary information. So that's what we'll be doing moving forward after today. So yes, uh, the, 20, the 2020 through 24 capital improvements program uh, to the city is attached, but the uh, materials room was not under 2.2. Okay. Any uh, further questions about the projects that we are going to be submitting to the city's capital improvement um, committee? So at this time, would someone like to take a motion? Uh, would, excuse me, would like to make a motion to that effect? Hey, this is Kyle. I I think Kyle just made a motion. I did, oh. sorry, my, it cut out. I, I moved to move approval. All right, is there a sec I second? Chris. Okay. Chris, so, I second it. All right, so it's moved and seconded. Any further discussion on this topic? Um, this is Nancy. There's also that item 21 uh, for carpet replacement. Was that included in something we already approved or do we need to approve that also so the carpet is listed on there as part of the plan for 2020 and this is actually the fourth and final year and we are in the process of uh trying to get the the quotes updated for that it's already been approved nancy so um that is okay. moving forward okay thank you okay any other further discussion Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? Aye. Sorry, any opposed? All right, thank you, motion uh, carries. Uh, next up we have uh, 2.3 and it's going to be a discussion on um, some library services that we may consider um, we uh, may consider doing for the first time in light of the Governor Evers' um, new Safer at Home order that's going to be extended through, I believe it's May 26th or 25th. Uh, I am going to turn this over to Garrett Erickson, and uh, and then he will have uh, his uh, both our uh, library um, managers uh, 
share some good information. And at that point, um, I am planning to go uh, and call on each board member, uh, trustee by name, to see if you have additional questions or comments about the information that is shared uh, by uh, Garrett and his staff. So I'm turning this over to Garrett at this time. Okay, so Governor Evers, um, as you all know, ex uh, issued an extension to the stay at home order. Um, and he had specific language this time in it in regards to public libraries um, opening up curbside service. So if you read the order, it says may open. So this is really a local decision um, that you all as board members get to make, make for us um, on whether we want to uh, provide this. So um, I'm going to, I guess there's really two parts to this that we're trying to figure out. And one is the delivery of materials, the curbside delivery. And then second would be returning the materials as well. And as we've been talking about this uh, with Melissa and, and and Cheryl and I, and then those two managers going out and talking with all of their staff. Um, there's just a lot of information coming in, and we're trying to process this all. And it's really, you know, we see this as a as a balancing act between uh, making sure the staff the staff are safe in delivering materials, as well as bringing it uh, bringing the materials back into the library, um, as well as. Uh, the, the other side of the of coin is b making sure that we're providing service to the community. And right now is just the best time ever for people to be getting library materials so that they've uh, got something productive to do at home. Um, and so I've been, I sort of divided this up and asked Melissa to, to talk today about uh, curbside delivery. And then Cheryl will be talking to us about the materials return process. Um, know that I think, in, in my opinion anyway, the, the curbside delivery is not so as difficult in the sense that um, we think that we can perhaps put a table or something out that people can go grab their materials once we've verified who it is and our staff can keep a distance from them. They really wouldn't be uh, handing anything to a person or anything. We can make that fairly safe. I think the materials return part is going to be a little bit more difficult. And so I know as as the two of them are going to describe uh, in, in proce the process in more detail, um, know that we could, you know, you can approve uh, one and not the other part of this uh, for now and, and give us maybe a little bit more time on the, on the uh, materials return. Um, that seems to be a little more tricky. The other piece to this is the state, the DPI, has been working with the Department of Administration to interpret this Evers extension. And DPI is due to come out maybe today or tomorrow with another interpretation that would give us more information on how to provide uh, the materials return service to start that back up. And so we're, we were hoping to get that in time for today's meeting so we would have more information. But uh, unfortunately, we did not get that yet. So um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Melissa to talk first about curbside delivery and how that might work. Hi everyone, this is Melissa. So if you've had a chance to read through uh, the proposal that we pulled together, that should give you a rough idea of how we're thinking this will work. But I will say that it's very much a work in progress and we are very much tuned into what other Wisconsin libraries are doing and um, trying to base our process on that. Uh, there's really no point in reinventing the wheel during a time like this. So um, we're looking to some of those other libraries to see kind of what they're doing with this. Um, the main thing here is keeping our staff safe while providing this, what I see as a very much essential service to our community. We know that this is something that folks um, really want and need, and um, the vast majority of our staff is really excited to start doing this. Um, so what this might look like for us is um, a, a probably about 10 staff in the building each day um, with no single person being here more than one day a week. Um, so we'd be staggering schedules in that way. Um, and logistically, we're still kind of working out the details, but um, we hope to allow people to both make uh, hold requests on the phone and using the catalog. Mm. Um, and then what we would do is have staff pull that material off the shelf, prepare it 
for uh, pickup, um, probably putting it in the bag, stapling it closed with the checkout receipt on it. It would look much like the hold receipts currently look. Um, so it would have part, part of the patron's name and card number, and then putting that outside on a table uh, when the patron lets us know that they're here. Um, we've talked about possibly um, carrying it out and putting it in people's trunks, but we also know that we have um, folks in the community who don't have cars and who will still need this service. So we wanna have uh, an option for just walk-up service as well. Um, we, we also outlined in this document ways that we will make sure that staff are distancing from each other as well as um, from the patrons. My hope is that this will be pretty much zero contact, that, that staff can place the material out on a table and then walk away and then the patron can come and retrieve it. Um, we do have some pop-up canopies in the library that we use in the past for outreach events that we can um, have outside in case it's raining. And we will have, excuse me, at least um, gloves and masks for the staff that will be uh, handing those materials out to the public. Um, we're also thinking about what other types of um, resources we can provide to the community during this time. So I'm sure you all know that we have been doing uh, virtual reference services and programming, um, but my concern has been that we're still missing so many people, um, both people who don't have internet access or who don't use Facebook. Um, so my staff and I have been really thinking about the ways we can reach those folks, and I think starting up curbside services will really help with that because we can start putting some resource guides in with people's checked out material um, and start commuting communicating some of those, those uh, resources to the community. So any questions about that at this point? So I yeah, think I, 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 I was just, well, just a second. Hi, it's Maeve. I'm going to uh, uh, go through each person if I can. Um, and uh, uh, I'm just checking with Garrett. He, he, I think he would prefer that Cheryl share her thoughts for returning materials, and then we are going to, I'm gonna call on each trustee uh, so we can get all of the questions uh, together. So Melissa, thanks. thank you for what you've shared, and the part that really resonated with me is trying to come up with a procedure that is very safe for our staff and a way for our, to make sure that we are uh, being very safe for our citizens to come up. And I just wanted to clarify too, someone, I may need to check their uh, mute button because I think we're getting some additional conversations. So I'm going to turn this over to Garrett. Thanks, Maeve. And so Cheryl um, is going to speak next about the materials return process. As I said, it's a little bit more uh, complex in the sense that now we have materials coming back and there has been varying degrees of discussion on how long something should be quarantined depending on what the material is made out of. So we've heard 24 hours for cardboard, which would be book covers, uh, versus 72 hours for plastic, which would be like, for instance, our DVDs and, and CDs being returned um, and so we'd have to set that material aside for a while. We also would need additional PPE um, equipment over and above what we have. Right now we do have some masks and gloves um, however, and we will be doing an order for more of them. However, we're thinking we might want to have gowns are available as well and some staff may feel comfortable with uh, some sort of a face mask as well. Um, you know, and the, the whole point of those is that someone doesn't touch a piece of material and then touch their face. And so that's what that would help cover up but Cheryl, are you ready to talk about materials return? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, this is Cheryl. So, yep, thank you. Uh, as Garrett mentioned, we are waiting for some guidelines from, from DPI, which we will take into consideration. But I would say our main concern right now is with the current guidelines that we have through the DPI, um, concerning curbside services, it limited uh, staff to one person per room for that. 
um, and and for returns in a library our size, uh, we would need to be almost at full staff level to adequately deal with returns. Uh, returns are not something we can turn on and off easily without confusing patrons. And once we open it up, I can tell you anecdotally that just the other day I was um, handing off some work to a staff member who just drove to, uh, to our staff door. And in a five minute period, I had two people drive up trying to return items and stopping and asking us about when we would be opening it back. So um, we are expecting a high volume of returned items with our current configuration in the page workroom. There's just no way for us to deal with those without having um, more than <laughs> more than one person in the in the room. And truthfully, I think we would probably need closer to a minimum of five. So. Uh, that's one of the things that we're waiting for is, is for some of those restrictions on uh, number of people to be lifted so that we can deal with these in, in, in a, a reasonable manner. Um, as far as the quarantining of items go, there are guidelines that we've been looking at. One, uh, the American Libraries Association uh, reference uh, document from the Northeast Document Conservation Center, and that's what we're basing our quarantine on. As Garrett mentioned, uh, things covered in plastic, they're recommending up to 72 hours of quarantining. And truthfully, uh, most of our items, even books, have mylar plastic covering on them. So that would be the majority of items that, that come through. So um, besides just handling the items to get them out of our uh, the room where we have the drive-through book drop located, um, it's going to require a lot of coordination for getting them on the cart or somewhere else where we can then put them where they will, no one will be in contact with them for, you know, probably up to 72 hours. I just want to make one clarification on what Cheryl said. So we, I thought that I had sent something out the other day um, after Sydney had sent out the agenda that was a, an interpretation from DPI, Shannon Schultz. Um, but Shannon did state in there that even though Mr. Evers, Governor Evers talked about one person in the room, what he was, the way Shannon interpreted that was that um, that could be in one library, but a bigger library, as long as they were, were within the six foot uh, distancing guidelines, it would be fine to have more than one person. So I think, um, again, we're waiting for DPI to issue their latest um, interpretation of Evers' order. Obviously, Governor Evers' order is, is not meant to be 100 pages long. It's supposed to be some, a framework. And then DPI helps libraries by putting out their interpretation of that to kind of help uh, directors and staff out to try and figure out how to make this work. And so um, we expect that to be coming out very soon. But I don't think it'll be, um, I don't think it was ever intended just to be one person in the room. And I can resend that out after the meeting just so that people can look at the interpretation. So at this time, now that both managers have had a chance to speak, I think we should open it up to board members. Yes, so I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, seeing if Meg Albrink has any questions or comments. I guess I just want to clarify my own understanding. So is uh, what we're saying is that at this point we're ready perhaps um, to be able to release materials, but we're not quite sure that we're ready to take materials back in. I think that's true, Meg. We, for one thing, we don't have uh, the protection that we want to uh, give to staff, such as we don't have any gowns, for instance, that um, we could use right now. So if someone was carrying books from the book drop to carts, perhaps in the in the middle room somewhere, um, we would want to give them that extra protection besides just a mask and gloves. So we do. We are in the process of of ordering that. Thank you. Um, and just following up, uh, 
Meg, you had um, asked earlier whether or not the uh, books that we would be uh, made available for the curbside pickup, that would be only the books that are in our uh, physical library. So it would not involve any uh, procuring books from any other uh, library in the Monarch system. So it would just be the materials that we have available in our um, building. And just another follow-up, um, there was a query about in the near future, maybe uh, being able to uh, add uh, back in home um, delivery. And uh, that's a service that our uh, library does for various entities in our community, primarily nursing homes. And so that is something that would be um, considered uh, a little bit later in this process once we have a good idea of how well the curbside pickup uh, go goes. So I just wanted to follow up on a couple of things that Meg had shared with me earlier. Uh, so uh, thank you, Meg, for your uh, questions and comments. Um, I'm going to move on now to Chris Camp to see if she has any questions or comments. Yes, um, Meg and everyone else. When Melissa was talking about the number of workers and all and that she's up to maybe 10, I was just wondering if a worker doesn't feel safe in doing the drop off or any of the pickup or whatever, will they be able to do something else in the building or at home instead of that? Hi, this is Melissa. Um, yes, this is entirely voluntary. Um, the staff that will be doing this have been asked whether they want to, and I've actually restricted it. Um, or I should say I've asked staff, any staff that fall into those high risk categories or who live with people who do to abstain from providing this service. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Good question. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Alderperson Mary Lynn Donahue. Hi there. I'm back on my phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good to have you back. To, uh, I don't have any I don't have any uh, particular questions. I just, as I always am, am just very impressed with the um, kind of the forward thinking and the energy that all of you folks bring to this. And um, I'm of the opinion that if, generally, if you think it's smart and if you think it's manageable, I'm going to think it's smart and I'm going to think it's manageable. And I just want to... Uh, just voice my appreciation for your tenacity and imagination and all those good things. And on that happy note, I have a four o'clock meeting, so I'll be ringing off a little after four. All right. Thank you, Mary Lynn. Uh, Marcos Guevara. Uh, other than uh, concur with what Mary Lynn just contributed, I don't have anything to add. Wonderful. Uh, moving on then to Nancy Manchin. Thank you, Maeve. Uh, as you said before, I think patrons will be really happy that they have an option to um, pick up. So uh, I compliment your work in preparing this and also in including those resource guides, thinking about those persons who um, you haven't been able to reach but could. Um, I wanted to ask how you would, how will you verify the patron when they come for a pickup? What would they need to have with them? Yep, great question. I'm wondering if Melissa would like to answer. Sure. So, um, it would be much like picking up a hold at the library where they would have their name and their card number. Um, staff would be uh, within view of the table for pickup, uh, but not actually interacting with the patron at all. In fact, the, um, some of the guidelines from DPI are pretty clear that we shouldn't be um, asking for signatures or taking library cards. All of that will be done over the phone. Okay. Okay. And, and then, too, um, outside, will you need markings on the, uh, the drive-through so um, uh, walk-ups or people in cars will know where to stop or where to wake or wait, rather, or keeping that distance between your, 
personnel and, and the patrons? Just wondering if Melissa, if you'd like to answer. Sorry, I was still on mute. Uh, <laughs> yes, we will be having some markers, um, especially for those patrons that might be picking up uh, by walking up to the table. We want to make sure people are not congregating around that. And then, and then finally, I wondered, it, um, had you dis uh, discussed at all taking temperatures um, of staff once you begin the pickup service? We have discussed it, and as of right now, we are asking staff to do that themselves, um, to take their temperatures daily before coming into work, and to not report if they have a fever or don't feel well. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Good questions. And uh, I just wanted to add in that I had uh, shared with Garrett uh, after I looked over this proposal that uh, maybe prior to it being instituted, any board of trustee that would like to be the guinea pig to allow the library staff to practice this whole curbside pickup, that uh, anyone who's interested can send me an email and we will show up when Melissa wants us to and we'll allow them to have a dry run. So just, just a thought for those of us who are, are, are available to do that. Um, yes. Calling on Kathy Norman next. Okay. Um, so I completely applaud doing the curbside pickup. I mean, I think especially with the governor's order, it, be, it we, we would look almost silly if we didn't do it because I felt like it was an encouragement for libraries to do that. It, it's the service more important than ever with people stuck at home, especially young children. Um, but with regard to drop off, I completely agree it's way more risky. So my, I'm thinking ahead to when all the sudden things open up and everybody starts dropping their stuff off all at once. And we're gonna have to have a procedure in place then because it's not necessarily gonna be that much safer. Um, and so I, I guess I would love for the staff to really be working quickly to try to figure out a procedure for drop off. You know, with, with safety, whether it's gowns, it's maybe leaving things untouched for three days so the virus can die or something. And, and trying to do a phase in slowly, I don't know how we do that. I'm, I'm, my creative mind isn't strong enough to figure it out. But so people can start dropping off stuff sooner and we can phase it in. So maybe some sort of deadline or goal for figuring out a process for drop off. This is Cheryl again. Um, so yeah, Melissa and I have been working on a long-term plan as well, trying to line it up with the Badger bounce back phases as far as um, how those restrictions are slowly being lifted off of organizations, uh, groups, all of that. Um, and we have definitely been thinking about how we will <laughs> be um, eventually bringing uh, or accepting those returns because uh, it's inevitable. Obviously, we want to get some of those materials back so other people can have a chance to borrow those. Um, I think we have a lot of the procedures figured out. Uh, some of the finer points as far as like where we're going to stage certain things um, are still a little bit up in the air. Um, but, but we've definitely made some good progress on that. Uh, right now, it's, you know, waiting to see how long it's going to take us to get the PPE that we think that we need um, and when we can have the number of staff that we need to do this in a safe way. Um, as far as staggering the returns, that idea has been bounced around a lot, not just in our library, but in libraries across the country right now, if not the world. Um, one of the things that we're trying to prevent and one of the reasons we're, we're a little hesitant to stagger returns, like assigning different due dates for you know different items or people, this has been a really stressful time for everybody and we really don't want to cause undue confusion. Um, we know we're gonna get hit with returns and I think it's probably gonna happen whether we stagger or not, we're just, we're gonna get hit. And we really just need to have adequate staffing to deal with that. Okay. 
All right, thank you. Uh, moving on then to uh, Sherry Speth. Hi, um, I thank you for all your efforts that you've been uh, working on. And uh, I really think it would be great to open it up that people can again get books and, and other uh, materials from the library. I'm very concerned with uh, returns and I'm glad you're thinking about it. I was wondering how much it's going to cost for uh, having and ordering all the personal protective equipment. I know you don't know at this time, but I was wondering how much it was going to be and where that money is coming from. So Sherry, I'm, I'm going to take a stab at that. So Debbie has been researching this with Bernie Romer, the city's purchasing agent, and there's a couple of ways that this could go. Um, first would be um, there's a state pool of materials that if we were able to get access to it would be free to us. Um, however, I don't know, uh, it's been asked what the priority is ver of a, a library staffer versus say someone who works for the fire department, and I don't have the answers to that, so I'm not sure how this state is going to allot those materials, but if we are given access, it's free to us. Um, the other option is going through the county, and the county would get us the materials at cost with no markup, um, but again, we would have to come up with that for the time being in order to provide the service, and I don't know if that would be a reimbursement or how exactly that would work. I would imagine it would come out of the budget for now, so it, it sort of, it depends. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you. And uh, my final question is uh, the last thing I've read lately about the uh, COVID-19 viruses that take the illness that uh, not everybody runs a fever that is ill. And um, I don't know if taking temperatures is, uh, well, it's helpful, but it's, it's not the last thing. You can before determining somebody shouldn't come to work or interact with your staff. Right. I know at the city right now, the fire department is the only one uh, taking temperatures of the employees. At least that's, that's my understanding. Okay. Thank you for okay. your, thank you for your questions. Uh, Kyle Welton. Thanks, babe. I don't have anything to add. Uh, I echo the comments of Mary Lynn and Marcos and others. I'm just thoroughly impressed, uh, again, at how agile and nimble the staff has been in responding to the crisis and being forward thinking and how we can serve our patrons. Um, I'm also really pleased. We talked about this at the very beginning of the shutdown before we were even fully closed. And this plan, I think, thoroughly addresses all the concerns we raised that kept us from offering curbside pickup at that time. Um, so thank you to the staff for, for, for your work on this, and I think it's a great service for the city right now. Great. Uh, thank you very much for all of those good questions and comments. It has been astonishing to me um, the number of messages and emails that I've received just as a library board uh, president, and I can only imagine the phone calls and emails that our library staff have gotten ever since the new uh, safer at home order came out with the bonus of being able to play golf and get books from your library. Um, we have been getting a lot of responses and uh, I certainly know lots of people within my family. My mother and my mother-in-law feel very guilty about having this pile of library books <laughs> that they've read and they're just like looming at them in the room that they haven't returned them and they feel like they're breaking some law and I have to keep telling them that it's perfectly fine that it stays in a pile. Uh, so I echo the uh, comments that everyone else has said of just how thoughtful this uh, curbside checkout has uh, uh, been uh, put together. I'm so pleased that it is really going to be up to the staff members that feel comfortable in being able to carry out this um, new service and that uh, we are going to try to do this in a 
safe manner as possible. And I do echo everyone's concerns about the conundrum of the return materials, because at some point, we do need to get our materials back. But the process by which we do that in a safe manner requires us to have the right equipment and the right procedure to make sure that everyone stays safe. Um, so uh, kudos to all the hard work that went into this. Um, my only uh, other thoughts that I wanted to share is I've gotten two separate emails from gardeners in town. They're really desperate for the seed library. So I have no idea if that can be something that <laughs> that people could get free packs of seeds, maybe start victory gardens all over Sheboygan, um, that, you know, as a thought. And then the other thought that I had, because uh, there's going to be so much uh, effort put into the uh, packets or bags of books for people, there are so many people that are not internet savvy to be able to even search for books that I'm wondering if there's a way to even put together a pack and say, here's the biography pack that librarians put together, or mystery pack, or top fiction, or top nonfiction. So librarians are putting an assortment together for people so they don't have to think of the author and the name or the title. And it's a way to really demonstrate and show off the incredible talents of our librarians. I mean, they know so much about our materials. It's a way to get a lot of resources that are in our library that maybe haven't been checked out in a while. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out. And I did get um, two emails, uh, people desperate for puzzles, because apparently our puzzle free puzzle lending library is really popular, and I did not realize that until we no longer shared them. And they could be the same thing if whenever we collect them, they would be treated the same way as the book because of the cardboard and the, and the, the paper. So uh, just things for Melissa and her team to ponder to think, to think if they are um, worthy at all. Um, so, uh, Maeve, yep. Maeve, this is Chris, sorry. I just had two other little things. One that Garrett just kind of touched on only because we've had to call our 36 families every week. And so I get to know lots of families even more so. Old Wisconsin is taking temperatures of their employees every day. And if they have a slight temperature, then they are sent home. That was from one of the fathers. Um, the other question though, I was wondering, will a relative or friend be able to pick up any materials for another person if they are not coming out for if they're ill or just don't want to? I'm not sure that we have the details of that figured out. Um, I, I would assume it would be similar to holds, Chris. So, um, but that's something we can talk about as staff. I'm not, I'm not sure at this point. One, one of the nice things that, uh, it, uh, that I've realized about getting all these different messages from people is just how much they miss their library and how much it's part of the routine of their daily life, that they go to the library every week. It's just part of the routine. And uh, I think the sooner that we can connect them with a meaningful service for them, it's a nice way to kind of remind them that we are really here for them and we, we are trying our best to make sure that they stay uh, healthy and safe during this. Um, epidemic. Um, the other point that I wanted to share that if 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 we get all the pieces in place, um, it's according to the uh, proposal that Melissa and her team have put together, uh, they would like to start the curbside checkout beginning Monday, May fourth. Hopefully, you know, and and uh, and then. In light of the challenges of just the return, I would anticipate that the earliest that we would do the return is maybe about two weeks later, one or two weeks later, depending on whether or not we have the protection uh, uh, materials in place. Um, and the reason I'm just kind of sharing these dates is that I, I think it's important that um, once we decide as a board that we would like to institute the curbside checkout, the sooner that we're able to communicate that with our community and that Josh can really put it out there, um, people will relax a little bit because one of the challenges of that new order coming out, people really felt curbside pickup should have happened the next day. <laughs> and they didn't, a lot of people are not thinking about how much work it is to even just get the proper bags for us to be able to put the books in. I mean, there's just so many multiple steps. Um, so um, at this time, uh, I, I am 
I'm in search of a, a, a motion to um, uh, to accept uh, the curb site checkout uh, service as detailed by um, the library staff. Uh, and I'm just wondering, maybe maybe I'll, uh, I'll take that back. I'm checking with Garrett. Is it helpful to have the curbside checkout be a separate, and then the return be a separate motion, or what are your thoughts? That that would be fine. That would make it very clear cut, I guess. And I, I mean, I I do think we could probably do the curbside much quicker, right. as opposed. So yeah, I, I think that's fair. Okay, so at this time, would someone like to make a motion to um, accept the new library service of curbside checkout with the hope that we can start Monday, May 4th, uh, as detailed in the proposal provided by library staff? Okay, it's been, okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, and at this time, um, I I'm a, would like for a motion to be put forward that uh, our library staff put together uh, the safety guidelines for uh, accepting returned uh, materials with the uh, uh, hope to uh, start that procedure May 11th or May 18th, completely dependent on whether or not protective gear and safety guidelines can be uh, instituted. This is Kyle Isamu. Okay, is there a second? I'll second, Kathy. All right, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? All right, thank you very much for that uh, very uh, detailed discussion. It was, uh, again, as everyone has already stated, uh, the detail and thought and care that's been put into this whole uh, process by Melissa and her team and Cheryl and her team really demonstrates the, the care and devotion they have to the citizens of our community. So uh, moving on then to um, 3.1, update in, on services and programming. So as usual, I'll have uh, Melissa do the services and programming update on what's what they're up to right now. Hello, everyone. Um, so just real quick, Maeve, I wanted to mention that the seeds will definitely be hmm. included in curbside pickup. Um, we're, we've had quite a few inquiries about that. We know everyone's eager to start gardening and growing food. So um, we will be including that in the list of things that folks can pick up curbside. And um, our staff has a lot of really great ideas for incorporating some of that reader's advisory piece into the curbside checkout too. So um, that's exciting. We definitely will be doing that. Uh, programs. So we have a couple of programs we are now offering weekly online, including uh, Little Revs ukulele classes which are consistently drawing 90 people for the live class and more for the recordings after the fact on YouTube. <laughs> and our story times and rhyme time for kids that uh, Susan and Allison are doing are consistently drawing around 50 uh, for the live viewing of those programs. So that's really exciting. Um, we're starting to look ahead to summer programs and really thinking about alternate delivery models for those. Um, so my biggest concern right now is that all of our programs are on Facebook, which really limits how many people have access to them. So um, we're really hoping that we get a little more um, wiggle room on letting people into the building so perhaps we can have some program performances in the library that are then recorded by WSCS um, 
so the wider community can access them, even if we can't have uh, full programs in the library with patrons participating, that we can find a way to get those out to people. Um, so that's the main thing we're discussing right now, and also how we're going to administer the summer library program just broadly um, with possibly our building continued and being closed. So we're working with the school district on that, getting that information out to families uh, before the school year officially ends, even though classes are, are not happening in person. And then we're also starting to look ahead to fall as well, since we really, we really don't know where we're gonna be, um, it seems like day to day, let alone six months from now, but we are starting to think about that um, much in the, in the same way. What programs can we offer in a different way? Um, what can we record and get out to the community? And um, possibly what things that we can do outside if there's um, some restrictions lifted on the number of people uh, that can have gatherings. So that's really what we're thinking about right now. And um, we're doing a lot of ordering of books so we can be ready for that influx of people um, for curbside pickup. We want to make sure we have all that new material on the shelf. And uh, that's pretty much it right now, unless anyone has questions. Does anyone have any questions? I've, I've been enjoying all of the online presence that uh, the Mead Public Library has been instituting. The sad thing is when we go back to in-person in programming, people are still going to probably want the online. So somehow <laughs> you're going to have to have to do both. But uh, it's been very good. Thank you. For 2.2, I'm going to have uh, Cheryl talk about what their staff is doing. Cheryl has uh, been in along with the maintenance staff almost every day, and they have been doing an incredible amount of painting in the library. So um, a lot of the rooms that you may have gone into, like old meeting rooms that were yellow and stuff, are no longer yellow. They look really <laughs> nice, but I'll let Cheryl kind of talk about that. Well, actually, now we all know that Garrett doesn't like the color yellow. So <laughs> At least noted, everyone. 70s yellow. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Cheryl. Um, so before I even talk about the painting, uh, the last thing that Melissa mentioned was that her staff are ordering a lot of books. We do have uh, our catalogers in the building. They're working uh, half of their weekly schedule in the building and they are processing all of those new materials that are being delivered and getting them out on the shelves or as is a lot of times the case, uh, filling holds with those new items so that they are ready to go once we do have curbside services opened up. Um, that said, yes, my staff has been doing a huge amount of painting. I don't know how they're not crazy or coming at me with pitchforks at this point because they're so sick of it. Um, but so we did have a contractor in, they finished work on painting all of our stairwells. Uh, we have more stairwells than I think many of you know we have. <laughs> it took them about a week to get that all done. We were lucky that there was some really uh, bad weather outside that kept uh, the, the contractor staff from working on some of their outside projects. So we had their whole staff working in our building for a week and it looks great. Um, my staff uh, is doing, as Garrett mentioned, a lot of uh, painting of, of other workrooms and conference rooms in the workroom area. Where they're trying to get uh, paint on the walls before new carpeting comes in um, and before we have a lot of staff in the building so that they can move desks and all of that around to do it. Uh, they're doing a great job. It looks really good. I'm excited to have you guys see some of the, the public rooms. I think you're going to like it. Um, and I'll just give a shout out to Josh. Our, uh, he's in, in charge of communications and all of our signage. And he has been instrumental in helping to pick some colors that are really tying the building together and giving it a new look. So uh, let's see. We are IT. A uh, specialist as well as our maintenance crew added some additional Wi-Fi access points to the outside of the building to provide better access to wireless in the, the parking lot as well as uh, closer to the main 
entrance. Our IT specialists uh, did walk around the whole uh, parameter of the building uh, on the sidewalks and was pleasantly surprised at how far the Wi-Fi access really does reach. Uh, towards the back of the building, he found that it actually goes to the bus stop that, that you'll see at, at one of our corners. Um, and we have been just anecdotally seeing people in the parking lot more and people walking up and, and just they'll pull out their phones and they, they start accessing that Wi-Fi. So that's good to see. Maintenance has also done some updates to the bathrooms. They have also added a new bubbler. We had one of our, our water fountains sprung a leak uh, the, the first weekend after we closed and we had uh, some water in the building, but they were able to um, clean all that up, put a brand new bubbler in and it looks good. And also, I don't think I've mentioned to this group yet, but uh, the two fireplaces are fully installed and working fabulously. Oh, nice. Oh, that's wonderful. Great I, updates. I love the fact that you took full advantage of the, no one in the building to do our crazy stairwells because there's no way we could have mm -hmm. patrons wandering around while we're painting those stairwells. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> I was just going to mention as uh, there's cars parked out in front of the library right now. So Maeve and I have a great bird's eye view from third floor of City Hall out those big windows. And there's people parked. There are There is a car out there. It looks like parked out there using Wi-Fi. And we have also observed a ton of cars driving up and trying to put materials in the book drops and I, I, I've got uh, on a, a regular tally. basis. And they're, I was going to uh, say, I have a tally mark. There have been 12 cars since we started this move. <laughs> meeting trying to get the books into the drop-off. So I'm feeling really guilty watching them and not being able to communicate what the plan will be, but they'll find out soon. So moving on to statistics, um, there's it's going to be really hard this year to really use this usefully, I guess, this document that we put together a few years ago because from this point on, we're going to be really low for uh, the rest of the year. We'll be obviously way under tally. Um, as I was looking at the February stats, what was frustrating is to see that we actually were on course to go up in physical checkouts for the first time. Obviously, only two months into the year, but we were actually increasing um, before everything went down south. So, um, uh, on the flip side, I guess the one thing is our e-content, uh, Chase has been talking about, and he has just said week by week he's been giving me some updates, and those are increased quite a bit. So at one point it was double the number of signups uh, from last year week to week. So that, that's a good sign that people are picking up and using our e-content anyway. I think what will be interesting as well and the statistics will be once we open back up, um, like in the, whenever we open fully back up just to see what our numbers look like. I mean, I have no idea at this point, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens here. I'm just looking at the, the chart, and because we tend to, you know, compare one year to the next, is it possible under the, um, in the column where it says March 2020, to put above that, just say COVID-19? <laughs> Just so that, you know, even three or four years from now, if everyone's doing a historical search to see where mm -hmm. things were. But I think just having it a clear explanation, I don't think anyone's going to forget what COVID-19 meant to um, libraries and communities all over. Right. I, pre I appreciate that, yes. Any other questions or comments on the information statistics? All right, uh, moving on then to our liaison reports, uh, 4.1, Monarch Library System. Uh, Nancy Manchin, what would you like to share with us? Thank you, Maeve. Um, uh, Jennifer Chamberlain, Executive Director, has been staying in touch with the board and with the directors. Uh, I think the last major update was about two weeks ago praising all of the libraries for the work that they've been doing, um, given the uh, uh, environment uh, that, that we are in. Um, they've, and telling us what uh, the Monarch staff has been at work at. And one of their um, uh, projects has been on a Facebook page 
for uh, the Monarch system. Since the beginning of March, they have increased their um, the person's following by 400%. Hmm. So hmm. she, I would encourage you if you haven't been to the Monarch website to check it out and, and to follow it. Um, coming up on May the 14th at one o'clock is a webinar uh, sponsored by IFLS Library System and the DPI. Um, entitled <laughs> the top 10 tips to educate your board um, how how to operate legally and effectively so um, I'll be listening in on, on that on the 14th and sharing uh, whatever I think you might like to hear and I'll, I'll also send a reminder that that's occurring um, Jennifer has accepted a position with the state library system. We were aware of that a couple of months ago, and then she reported that she was being considered uh, as a finalist and recently uh, let the board know that she will finish her contract, which we had given her for six months and ends in the beginning of June that she will finish the contract and then leave that position with the Monarch system. Tomorrow, um, the um, uh, committee will be formed, uh, a search committee, to look for a new person for that position. Um, I think given the work that the staff did uh, before Jennifer stepped into that position and the work by that committee that I think the transition process process should go pretty well. And Jennifer's really done a terrific job um, putting new things in place and getting things done that that needed to be done for the catch up. So I'm, I'm feeling uh, confident about what's going to happen in this transition period. Uh, th thank you for that uh, report, Nancy. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed for, for Monarch because I, I I, uh, I felt that she really did just an incredible job stepping in and yeah. truly, you know, really trying to, to manage the needs of all of our libraries so that we can, you know, meet the needs of citizens. So I'm, uh, I'm, so, I, I'm happy. Board. Yeah, I'm going to say I'm happy. I'm sorry, a member of the executive board commented that she was definitely overqualified for that job. And that was probably true, and we saw the results of that with all the work that she was able to accomplish. My, my only thought is that um, uh, if, if the Monarch system, and I'm sure they will get another wonderful candidate that's an interim, if they are uh, wonderful and they're in the interim position, the sooner they can be offered a, a position uh, might be the, the, the best course of action for, 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 for our library system. Sometimes when people are in that interim category, they don't really know what their future is with the organization. So um, I'm happy for her because she'll be excellent at what, where she's going, and, and, uh, um, I'm, uh, and I'm happy that uh, we have a good team of people at Monarch that will help the needs of our citizens still be met. But uh, I was hoping she was going to stay for a few years in that position. So that's just my, my <laughs> personal yeah, viewpoint. Yeah. Thank you, Maeve. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. Um, our next meeting will be uh, May 28th uh, at 3.45. Uh, it remains to be seen whether or not we will be doing that at our library, uh, what it will look like. It might be that I'm still in the Common Council chambers attempting to figure out which microphone is working. <laughs> uh, and all of you were so patient uh, calling in and taking turns. Um, I really do feel like we had a great discussion and we learned a lot at this meeting. So I appreciate you taking time today uh, to make that work. Um, and at this time, would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? This is Meg, so moved. Is there a Great. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye.
Any opposed that they want to stay longer? <laughs> All right. Listen, everyone stay safe. And uh, please send me a message or an email if you would like to be a guinea pig and helping with the curbside uh, pickup, if Melissa would like to have people to help test that out. Um, thank you so much and have a great rest of the week.